So the word epiphany comes almost directly out of the Greek. Epi means upon or on. Phaneros means visible, apparent, or manifest. An epiphany is more than just a light bulb moment or an aha moment. An epiphany is something that is revealed to you, something where light shines and makes something clear and manifest. So the Magi received an epiphany for all of us. They saw God made flesh. They saw salvation for all people. But the wise men weren't the only characters in scripture to have epiphanies. The apostle Paul had one on the road to Damascus. He referred to it as a revelation where God called him to change his life. If you have an epiphany, but then your life goes on as it was before, maybe it wasn't actually an epiphany. Epiphanies aren't just learning new things. It's important to learn new things, don't get me wrong. The Magi had been studying the star charts, they'd been reading prophecies so that they were prepared when they saw the star and they were equipped to follow it. And God can make God's self manifest in many different ways, but for the Magi, they were present for their epiphany, for the revelation of Jesus as the savior of the world, both because they'd been preparing for it and because they had eyes open to see it. So the Magi studied and prepared so they'd be in the right place for the Epiphany, but they did more than just that. Because if looking at their star charts was all they had done, they would never have seen Jesus. They had to leave their telescopes and go on a journey. Studying the Word prepares you to encounter the Word in the world. And the Magi encountered quite a bit. They left Persia and they journeyed to Jerusalem. They met King Herod. They went to Bethlehem where they, like the shepherds in Luke's gospel, saw the star stopped over the family and they bowed down and worshiped him. Persian astrologers bowing down before a humble Hebrew baby. Quite a change, I would imagine, from their routine at the university. Of course, this epiphany was just the beginning of the changes for the Magi. And not all change is easy. The epiphany of a child born as a king in Bethlehem shook the very palace in Jerusalem. The world responds when God breaks into the world, and the world does not always respond peacefully, if you want to read ahead in chapter 2. When small men like Herod are afraid, everyone is afraid, we're told. The Magi were warned in a dream not to return to Herod, so they leave for their own country by another road. And Matthew doesn't tell us what happens next for the Magi. Did they make it home? Did they get lost? If they did make it home, what was it like to return to their routine? Imagine parking your camel in the garage and walking into the house. Everything looks the same, but you're not the same. Your spouse is ready for you to take out the trash and do the other chores that were left while you were traveling. But you've dipped your toes in the Mediterranean. You followed a star and it led you to a child. You felt God's presence in this baby. You offered gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh to his mother. You saw that look of confusion in her eyes as she wondered where in the heck they were going to put that when they got home. You know the world is not the same, but you're alone in that knowledge. Everybody else just wants your life to return to the way it was, but you can't. You've ridden on a camel for months, fleeing King Herod. First you thought he was going to kill you. Then you heard reports and realized he had killed babies because of you. Had you not gone to him asking if you could worship the king, those babies would still be alive. Life is not usual anymore. This infant God has changed the world, has changed you, and you cannot pretend it didn't happen. Epiphany is about God coming to us in ways we cannot unchange. We can never see the world the same way. We don't know what happened to the Magi when they returned home, but we do know once you encounter Jesus, you travel on different roads. And while they had prepared for an epiphany and had actually gone on a journey to see it, I bet they didn't expect what happened. Do you think? Who do you think they thought they were giving their royal gifts to? Had they been looking for Jesus on a small ranch house on a cul-de-sac in Bethlehem, would they have gone to Herod in the palace seeking a king? 
Even when we seek God, we rarely seem to find who we expect. There's another problem with epiphanies, of course. They don't always translate. The Magi had to flee King Herod for their lives when he heard the epiphany. They're not something you can give to someone else and say, here, have an epiphany. Sometimes people have to have their own experience of the divine. The most the Magi could do was tell people what they'd seen. The most we can do is live our lives reflecting the light of the star that shined on us, hoping it will shine its light for somebody who finds themselves in shadow. So where do you find yourself this epiphany? Maybe like the Magi, you've done your work and you're actively seeking God. Or maybe you've already had your epiphany and you know that loneliness of the experience when others just don't know what it feels like to be different even though you look the same. Or maybe like all of Jerusalem, you're afraid because Herod is afraid. Sometimes the forces that want to keep power where it has been and want to keep things from change, those powers can be strong and scary. Wherever you are individually in the midst of this journey, I'm grateful that we get to be here together to help each other along the way. Wherever you are is okay. We recognize our faith is a personal experience, but it does not have to be a private or a solitary one. You don't have to walk this journey by yourself. One of the reasons we've been pushing a return to community post-COVID is because we're all in different places on this journey and we need each other's help to navigate our way through it. We're glad you're here. I'm going to close with a poem by Anne Weems called Stargiving. And I don't believe she's any relation to John, now that I think about it. That's pretty true. What I'd really like to give you for Christmas is a star, she writes. Brilliance in a package. Something you could keep in the pocket of your jeans or in the pocket of your being. Something to take out in times of darkness. Something that would never snuff out or tarnish. Something you could hold in your hand. Something for wonderment. Something for pondering. Something that would remind you of what Christmas has always meant. God's advent light into the darkness of this world. But stars are only God's forgiving, and I must be content to give you words and wishes and packages without stars. But I can wish you life as radiant as a star that announced the Christ child's coming and is filled with awe as the shepherds who stood beneath its light. And I can pass on to you the love that has been given to me, ignited countless times by others who have knelt in Bethlehem's light. Perhaps, if you ask, God will give you a star. Friends, epiphanies and stars are only gods to give. But as I've mentioned earlier, we have this tradition of passing out star words on epiphany. And so I invite you to consider how this word might speak to your life in this new year. Perhaps it could be used to lead your prayer this year. Perhaps you could tape your star to your refrigerator or your bathroom mirror. And when you see it, you can remember to be prepared for the divine to be revealed to you wherever your journey may take you. I am thankful to be with you on this journey, and I look forward to hearing how God may be revealed to you this year. Amen.